It is indeed a privilege and an honor to uh, be with you this morning, uh, to have the, the privilege to stand uh, at this desk and proclaim God's word to you. I am so grateful for uh, the invitation and the welcome that I have received, uh, particularly from, uh, from the uh, Taylor family, Brother Bryant, House Taylor, Hotel Taylor, <laughs> putting me up, working out with me, doing my CrossFit, uh, to your pastor, uh, Brother Albert McGowan, who I count as a dear friend. Uh, thank you as well for your welcome and invitation. I have uh, seen a Redeemer from afar. Um, I have certainly, uh, there have been many times uh, over the past number of years where I needed to be preached to and I would, and I would click on Redeemer Jackson's website and listen to a sermon from my brother Mike Campbell and have the good news of the gospel preached into my own soul. So you've blessed me from afar for, uh, for many, many years. And so I bring you greetings from Columbia, Maryland, and City of Hope Presbyterian Church, the church I am privileged to, to serve. I want to share with you, I want to pray in just a moment, but I want to share with you this morning from the first chapter in the book of Exodus, uh, verses 1 through 14. As you see there in your bulletin, the message is titled, They Don't Die, They Multiply. They don't die, they multiply. And here it is, there's just one simple thing I want to get across to, to you this morning. It really is a simple point of everything that I say is, is leading to this one point and conclusion. And it is that the promise of God ensures, the promise of God ensures that neither the schemes of man nor the powers of hell are able to derail his plan. The promise of God ensures that neither the schemes of man nor the powers of hell are able to derail his plan. Would you look with me at first 14 verses of Exodus chapter 1. Here is God's word. These are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob, each with his household, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan, and Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. All the descendants of Jacob were 70 persons. Joseph was already in Egypt. And then Joseph died, and all his brothers, and all that generation but the people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong so that the land was filled with them. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, Behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply. And if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. They built for Pharaoh's store cities, Pithom and Ramses. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and the more they spread abroad. And the Egyptians were in dread of the people of Israel. So they ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in all kinds of work in the field. In all their work, they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. Would you pray with me? Not to us, O oh Lord, not to us, but to your name belongs all of the glory. We say this morning, who is sufficient for these things? Who is sufficient to stand here and 
and dare proclaim what thus says the Lord. And I confess in my strength and in of myself, I have no sufficiency to do that thing. But I do say with the Apostle Paul that I have been crucified with Christ and it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life that I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who gave himself up for me. So Lord God, you are my sufficiency. You are our sufficiency. And would you therefore take these weak and unworthy labors in your word and use them to your purposes. Would you meet us where we are and give us what we need? Be gracious to us, O oh Lord, if we need faith, would you give us faith anew or renew our faith? If we need encouragement, would you meet us in encouragement with your gospel truth? If we need correction, would you in your mercy correct us? If we need, Lord God, strength to endure, would you give us that? You know all things. You know who we are from beginning to end and know what we need. And we entrust ourselves to you this morning in Christ's holy name. Amen, amen. and amen. Well, just about 32 years ago in 1984, a hit movie Gremlins was released. Many of you are familiar with that movie. Even if you weren't born in 1984, it became a hit and have been seen, has been seen for a whole generation. And that story, all right, in Gremlins starts out with a, a struggling inventor named Randall Peltzer. And, uh, and this man, Randall, was looking for a unique Christmas gift for his son, Billy. And so he, he goes into Chinatown in his in a small town there, and in, and in this uh, shop in Chinatown, he, uh, he comes across, uh, quite by accident, this furry little uh, uh, creature called a mogwai. And it, for him, is the perfect creature to give to his son. It's the perfect, unique gift. But the, but the elderly gentleman who owns and runs this, uh, this shop it refuses uh, to sell it to him. With a Mogwai, he says, with the Mogwai comes great responsibility. And so Randall leaves the store uh, a bit dejected because he can't buy this gift for his son. But unbeknownst to him, the, uh, the grandson was, uh, was listening. Is, uh, the store owner's grandson sneaks out to, uh, to, to him, to Randall, and, and, he, and he brings the Mogwai with him. And he agrees to sell it to him because the family needs the money. And as cute as this mogwai might be, it's not your normal house pet. Uh, the boy tells him there are some rules that you have to follow if you're going to own a mogwai. He says, first of all, you've got to keep him out of the light. Uh, 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 he hates bright light, especially sunlight. It will kill him. Uh, the second rule is don't give him any water, not even to drink. And the third rule, well, the third rule, the most important rule of them all is, is uh, the rule that you can never, ever forget is that no matter how much he cries, no matter how much he begs, never, ever feed him after midnight. Happy Randall agrees to these rules and takes the Mogwai home to his son Billy and gives him the name Gizmo. Happy Bill, Billy receives this gift and even if you haven't seen the movie, you can imagine what happened. It wasn't very long after Gizmo is in this house that the rules start to be broken. Uh, some water spills on little Gizmo, and these little balls start popping out of his side. And, and these little balls form into other mogwai. And these other mogwai, they're not so kind and friendly as, as little Gizmo. And so what they do to Billy is they use some trickery. They kind of they uh, 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 switch up his alarm clock to, to trick him into giving them some food after midnight. And they get this food after midnight. They develop cocoons like, like caterpillars, right? And, and they morph and they change. And then the next thing you know, these, these gremlins come out. And the gremlin ringleader, Stripe, he decides what he's going to do is he's going to find a pool and jump in it. 
strike jumps in the pool and you see the water just bubbling up, right? And all of a sudden, the, the town is, is overrun with these, with these gremlins, these handful of little gremlins, right? These five gremlins, they multiplied into a swarm that practically filled the whole town, terrorizing it. And when it, when it came to the, to the gremlins, the sense that they had in this town was like, you know, babies, kids, we don't die. We multiply. As much as the town tried to stop the spread of these gremlins, they just couldn't do it. Well, that is exactly how the Egyptians felt here in Exodus chapter 1. That is exactly how they felt try and try as they might to stop the spread of the children of Israel. They just couldn't do it. They wouldn't die. They were like the, the gremlins. They kept multiplying. The text tells us in verse number 12 that the Egyptians, they were in dread of the people of Israel. That is, they hated the people of Israel. And it's not like uh, the, the gremlins, like, like it's not like Israel was terrorizing the land of, of Egypt. What we are actually seeing in Exodus chapter 1, we are, what we are seeing is actually the ongoing story of God's promise being worked out and fulfilled in real time and real space. The story that begins in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15 after Adam and Eve sinned by eating the forbidden fruit and, and God promised that the, that the seed of the, of the serpent would, uh, would, would bruise the heel of, of the woman's seed, but that the seed of the, the woman would crush the, the, uh, the, uh, the seed of the serpent. Uh, that story that, that continues in Genesis chapter 12 when the Lord calls Abraham to himself and he promises Abraham that he's going to make of him a great nation. And in Genesis chapter 15, when Abraham was told by the Lord to, to look towards the heavens and, and to number the stars if he was able, so shall your offspring be, the Lord says to Abraham. This in Exodus 1 is the continuing story of God's promise. And, and the point is, because of his promise, his people don't die, they multiply. And so four things I want to share with you this morning from this text. Four Ps. We're going to talk about that word promise, the promise. We're going to talk about the problem, the, the persecution, and the proliferation. A promise, problem, persecution, and proliferation. And as I mentioned already that this, uh, this text is about God's promise, our first P being realized in time and in space. And it's being laid out for us right here at the very beginning of the book of Exodus. And none of our English Bibles actually make this clear, but there's a little word that, that ought to be there at the very beginning of this book. The first word in the book of Exodus is literally the word and. It's not there in the, in the English because that's not proper English grammar to start a sentence, or much less a book with a conjunction, right? But it's perfectly fine in Hebrew. That verse 1 should be translated, and these are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob, each man with his household. And the reason that I'm pointing this out to you is because there is an intentional connection being made here at the beginning of, of Exodus to what has been said before about this family. Everything leading up to this point. In, in fact, at one point, Genesis and Exodus may have even been a single book. And so then after Moses, the author, he makes this connection for us. And these are the names of uh, the sons of Jacob. He lists for us the names of the sons in verses 2 to 3. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan, and Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. This is almost a word-for-word -word repetition of what you find in Genesis chapter 35, verses 23 to 26. And if you look there, you, what you would find is that the sons are not listed from oldest to youngest, as you might expect. 
Uh, people ask me, even this morning, you know, uh, how many kids do you have? And I tell them, I got four kids. And then I start to tell them, my oldest is 23, and my uh, next one is, is 19. And then I start listing them where they are, what they're doing, their ages from oldest to youngest. But that's not what's happening here. Uh, these, ch- these sons are, are listed according to who their mama was. See, if you know the story, there was a lot of drama in Jacob's family. Now, Jacob wanted to marry his uncle uh, Laban's daughter, Rachel, but but his uncle Laban tricked him into marrying his oldest daughter, uh, uh, Leah, first. And and Leah had had six sons, uh, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun. And he was finally able to marry his, his true love, Rachel. And Rachel had two sons, Joseph and Benjamin. And in that household, Leah and Rachel, they had their own little competition going on. And they would one-up each other by, by giving their, their, their maidservant to Jacob. And so Rachel's servant, Bilhah, had two sons, Dan and Naphtali. And Leah's servant, Zilpah, also had two sons, Gad and Asher. And there's your list. Joseph is missing from the list because we're told in verse 5, he was already in Egypt, right? He was the reason that Jacob and his sons and their families were able to escape the famine in the land of Canaan and find refuge in Egypt. And then it says in verse 6 that Joseph died and all of his brothers and that entire generation died. Everybody died. But the point is the promise of God didn't die. Verse 7 tells us that the people of Israel were fruitful. See, notice this with me. Even the words that's translated in verse 7, people of Israel, are the same words that's translated in verse number 1 as sons of Israel. What a difference. Sons of Israel in verse 1, people of Israel in verse 7. And that's a, that's a, a proper translation. Why? Because there has been a, tr- there's been a transition from this nomadic small band of 70 people to a numerous number of people. A numerous nation of people. Look at the description of them in verse 7. It says they were fruitful. They increased greatly. That, that is, they, they, they swarmed. They teamed. They were like a swarm of people. They multiplied. They grew very, very, very strong. The land was filled with them. See, here's the deal. They are starting to be as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand of the seashore, just like God promised. But see, It's not because they're this model picture of perfect people who deserve this blessing. See, the family itself was formed through trickery and deception. They're in Egypt because some of their great-great-great-grandfathers sold their other great-great-great-grandfather into slavery. This is a family with a checkered past. This is a family with a checkered past that keeps messing up and messing up. But listen, the promise of God trumps everything. The promise of God trumps everything. Listen, the promise of God is not hindered by the foolishness and the stupidity and the trickery and the deceitfulness and the ignorance of people. You and I are messed up. We are jacked up folk. But listen, here's the deal. We're not jacked up enough to throw God off course. You ain't messed up enough to throw God off of his course. You understand? The mess of this world does not make God sweat. The mess of it, God is indeed grieved by sin and evil, but, but, the, but the evil and the, and the deception and the ills of this world don't make him break a sweat at all. Nothing is able to throw him off of course. He, he grieves, but he doesn't sweat his promises of redemption and restoration of justice and righteousness. It permeates the book of Exodus. Indeed, it, it permeates the entire Bible itself. And no power of hell and no scheme of man is able to throw him off of that kingdom purpose. See, the promise of hell, it shows up right here in our text. We find out, uh, our second P, that there's a problem in verse, verses 8 to 10. 
tells us that a new king came to power in Egypt. Uh, and that time had elapsed and we are centuries removed from Joseph serving as the prime minister over Egypt and saving the country from, uh, from doom and, and famine. And all this new pharaoh knows is that the whole country is filled with these Hebrews. Pharaoh says in verses 9 to 10, Behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly, or that is, with some kind of wisdom with them, lest they multiply. And if war breaks out, they, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Can I put what Pharaoh is saying for you? Can I put it for us in, in contemporary American vernacular? Pharaoh is saying, listen, Egyptians, we got a problem with these immigrants. Uh, Pharaoh is in verses 9 and 10. He's giving the Egyptian State of the Union address. He, he's got the, the, the country assembled together. The citizens are assembled together to hear him. And he tells them, listen, we have a major national crisis. These people are different than we are, and we've let them practically take over our country. They're stronger than we are. Understand the political tactic of leaders creating fear among the people in order to get them to go along with the program is not new. It is ancient. Pharaoh played on the Egyptian sense of, of ethnic and national superiority. Again, Genesis chapter 43, do you remember what happened when Joseph was prime minister of Egypt, second in command, and, uh, and he looked and he talked like an Egyptian, and his brothers came down from Canaan for the second time to, to buy grain uh, uh, because of the famine, and Joseph prepared a, a banquet for them, but he sat at his own table, and we're told in Genesis 43 uh, that, that the servants served Joseph by himself and the brothers by themselves, and, and even the Egyptians. Egyptians who ate with Joseph were separate from the Hebrews because it says in that scripture the Egyptians could not eat with the Hebrews because that was an abomination to them. And that attitude had not changed in centuries. So Pharaoh doesn't have to create this sense of, of national superiority. He just has to use it for his own advantage. He says in verse 10, listen, people of Egypt, we got to deal shrewdly with these immigrants. We got to be wise in how we deal with the Hebrew problem. They are a threat to national security. We got a whole nation of non-Egyptians living in our country, and they are not loyal to us and to our values and to our ideals. And if war comes, they're going to join with our enemies, and, and they'll fight against you. They'll take your jobs. They'll take your wealth. They'll take your power. And we should be seeing some parallels. We should be seeing some parallels. Some bells actually should be going off in our minds. See, because we can look, right? We can look and, and we can and see in our text the evil that is at work in Pharaoh's heart. We can clearly see the power of hell behind the problem that is presented in our text. But we should be able to make the connection to our current day. The beauty of the congregation I'm privileged to serve is that it's a, 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 a multicultural, mixed ethnic uh, congregation. People from uh, various cultures and, and, and backgrounds, ethnic, national, and, and immigrants. And, and the same thing is true here in, in this church. Some of us might feel very deeply about how we talk about immigration in this country. Every Every presidential candidate you've heard, or every, every one of them has, has had to talk about what we're going to do about the immigration problem. I know y'all wasn't expecting politics this morning. <laughs> I'm just preaching the word, okay? I'm just saying what's saying. Listen, every one of them has had to talk about the immigration problem. And it's as if we are not talking about real people made in the image of God who are deserving of dignity and value and worth because of that fact. In this country's current debate over immigration, where we see everybody talking about those people and, and have a those people attitude and, and, and they're different uh, than us and, and they're going to destroy our country attitude, 
When you, when you see that kind of attitude manifesting itself, what you are seeing is a heart that is closer to Pharaoh than to Jesus Christ. What we see Pharaoh saying here to his people in Exodus chapter 1 reminds us of the fact that the image of God is imprinted on every soul and that has implications for how we think about people and how we treat them. You understand in Egypt there was only one who was made in the image of God and that was Pharaoh, the king. And then, and then any, anybody who was his people were those who were deserving of, of dignity and respect. So it's easy to dehumanize and commodify other people because they don't deserve that kind of dignity. Listen, this is what I'm getting at. We have a natural tendency to categorize people into a group of others. Whoever those others are, they become thought of as, as those people. And that makes it easy to dehumanize people and think of them only as a commodity. We want to know, do those people, do they add to or they do, do they detract from our society? Do they, do they add to or they detract, detract from, from who we are as a, as a country? And listen, God would not have us look and think about image bearers that way. See, the problem of dehumanization and commodification of people in our text, it actually leads to a horrific persecution. We are told in verse number 11 that because of, of Pharaoh's powerful State of the Union address, the people are on board with the slavery and oppression program. So they, they set taskmasters over the children of Israel to afflict them with heavy burdens. They built for Pharaoh store cities of Pithom and, and Ramesses. It says in verse 14 that it, they made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and in brick and in all kinds of work in the field. Two times in verse 13 at the beginning and verse 14 at the end, it says they treated the Hebrews ruthlessly. And that word for ruthless, it always includes the, the idea of violence. We're getting a picture painted for us of how bad it was for the people of Israel, for the children of Israel. And you see, I want to point something out here in relationship to this persecution. There is a connection with what's happening here in Exodus 1 and, and what happened in Genesis chapter 11. At the end of Genesis 11, God calls Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldeans and he makes that promise that I talked to you about earlier that he's going to bless Abraham and make him a great nation. And that account in Genesis, it comes on the heels of the, of the Tower of Babel account where the people who stood against God's command, they, they built uh, uh, this city and this tower. Uh, they said up to the heavens and, and, and in that chapter, they use the same kind of language that Pharaoh is using here. They said, come, let us, let us uh, make bricks. Come, let us build ourselves a city. And here is Pharaoh in Exodus 1 saying, come, let us, let us deal shrewdly with them. Just as the people of Babel were building a city and a tower against God with brick and mortar, the Egyptians are forcing the people of God to, to build cities out of brick and mortar that stand against God. And the point is those who stand against God are always committed to building monuments to their own glory. The, the concern of Babel in Genesis 11 was that they didn't want to be dispersed and spread out over the face of the whole earth. The concern of Pharaoh here is that the children of Israel are dispersed and spread out over the face of the whole land. The, the persecution comes because what we are seeing in this text is the ancient battle between the city of God and the city of man. See, in God's kingdom, in, in God's city, God is acknowledged to be the one with all the power and all the authority and all of the glory. And when the Lord is not acknowledged to, as the one with all power and glory, what people do is heap up power and glory for ourselves. The contrast at play is the contrast between actually the pursuit of, of loving God and the pursuit of trying to be God. 
And it's not something that's just relegated to, to Pharaoh's day. A couple of years ago in July 2014, crew in the inner city, Campus Crusade for Christ, uh, they had a, uh, their inner city ministry, they did a conference that summer uh, called Creating Options Together. And the purpose, they said, of that conference was to, to lift up and empower the church, to demonstrate the power of the gospel, to create options for those in, in poverty, fresh options that address real needs. And one of the speakers at the conference uh, was uh, Karen Ellis. Some of you may be familiar with, with her. And, uh, and she, she, she gave a speech that she titled, My People, My People, A Letter to the Church in America. And she made the point, she said, if God is on the throne, there is no power struggle. But if we're on the throne through self-exaltation, you have oppression somewhere, somehow. She says, she said, power is always going to be abused in that situation. And someone is going to be denied the right to the fullness of their God-given humanity. Satan, she said, is incredibly uncreative and unimaginative in his tactic, tactics, but he's so effective because he's so good at marketing. Here's a direct quote. Here's what she said. She said, while the social fabric of oppression changes from age to age, the general contours of abuse and degradation remain the same. It's just different packaging. Look at the similarity from one oppressive regime to another. Destruction of name and identity, destruction of culture, violation of women, emasculation of men, false accusations, unjust courts, the limiting of travel, zone housing and to substandard conditions, denial of societal advancement. These are the same things, if you want to read through these opening chapters of Exodus, these are the same things that happen in the oppression of God's people in Exodus. Turn to the book of Acts and find out those are the same things that you'll read about, the persecution of the early church. Turn to the book of Revelation and find out that those are the same things in the persecution that Christians were enduring in the seven letters in Revelations chapter 2 and, and 3. Those are the same facets of human degradation that black Americans had to endure during slavery and Jim Crow. The same tactics that are being employed today by people who are hostile to Jesus Christ and his kingdom. It does not matter if you are talking about Boko Haram in Nigeria or, or ISIS in Syria and Iraq or in the government of North Korea or other places, different faces, but the same tactics. Same kinds of tactics to persecute and oppress. oppress. And listen, that fact, that fact, the, 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 the devil being so uh, unimaginative and uncreative but so effective because of his marketing skills uh, the same thing over and over again that fact might actually leave us depressed if it were not for the other reality that comes back around in our text started the message in the first few verses about how the promise of God trumps everything it, it trumps the fact that the people of God are messed up and don't have their act together but it also trumps the power of Satan in his attempts to destroy the work of God look at verse number 12 it says but the more they oppressed them the more they multiplied and the more they spread out and the Egyptians were in dread of the people of Israel the, the result of the persecution was proliferation. And Pharaoh's evil and oppressive tactics actually had the absolute opposite effect of what he desired. He desired to destroy through oppression and persecution to contain, but the absolute opposite thing said the more they were oppressed, the more they were pressed down, the more they were oppressed, the, the more they grew and proliferated and multiplied. Well, why is that? Why is that? Why did that happen? It happened because there's no power of hell or scheme of man that's strong enough to stop God and throw him off track. They expanded exponentially. Understand, this is what Jesus is talking about in our scripture reading that we had this morning from Matthew 16. 
Who are you? Who do men say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And, and Simon Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, listen, flesh and blood did not reveal that to you, but my father in heaven revealed it to you. And here's the connection. Listen, you're Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. You understand the promise of Jesus Christ. Jesus takes the same place that the Lord took in, in Exodus and, and the people of God. He says, my church will not die. She will multiply. I will build my church. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus promises not even the gates of hell itself will be able to stand against his kingdom of God expansion program. There's a song we love to sing at City of Hope, and I don't know if you sing it here, but it's the song, Jesus, my great high priest, and that last stanza in the song, it says, it says, should all the, the hosts of death and powers of hell unknown put their most dreadful forms of rage and mischief on, I shall be safe, for Christ displays his conquering power and guardian grace, his conquering power and his guardian grace, and so I can approach the throne with confidence. Listen, the song of everyone who belongs to Jesus is safe in the arms of Jesus. The song of everyone who belongs to Jesus, to the people of God, is safe in the arms of Jesus. And this is especially so in the most intense and difficult and, and, and hard of conditions. Persecution in Egypt church causes the Old Testament church to expand. A persecution in the book of Acts causes the New Testament church to expand. Persecution in China causes the church to expand. They don't die, they multiply. A quote from Karen Ellis again. She says, listen, the church with, uh, expands exponentially under persecution because Satan unwittingly creates the very environment where the need for hope and faith in Christ are most necessary. Amen. It happens because, because the, the devil, the dummy that he is, he creates the very environment where faith and hope in Christ are most necessary. Listen, okay, I'm a, I did this at 8 o'clock. This is not in my notes, but I'm meddling again. Why do you find the church in America, why do you find evangelicals? Why do you find this, this cry, oh, our country is going to hell in a handbasket. Laws are being written that it's going to be tough for us. There's all kinds of ungodly. I get it. But we act like we are afraid, like, like, oh no, we're, we're gonna, we're, people are not gonna like us, and we're gonna, we're gonna suffer like some injustice and some persecution for belonging to Christ. We won't be able to speak the name of Christ without people looking at us strange. Well, what do you think the Lord promised you anyway? I mean, what, do you think He promised His people? that they would always live in safety and security. No, he promised, I will be with you. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. All hell can break loose. And the question you have, like, okay, who is our God? Is our God comfort? Is our God having the right laws in place so we can, we can have a country we want? Or is our God the Lord of glory who gets to determine times and seasons? He raises up leaders and he, he casts them down and he says to his people, you just endure no matter what. Yeah, yeah. It makes promises like, listen, though, though, the, though you pass through the flames, you won't be burned. Yeah. Makes crazy promises like that. Even if, even if all hell breaks loose, you're safe in my arms. Listen, 
You'll find if you keep reading just through Exodus, you get to the end of chapter 2 that Israel is going to be groaning and crying out to God for help because of their harsh slavery. And God is going to hear and answer and respond like he always does. And the reality is, listen, the ultimate fulfillment of God's promise of proliferation to Abraham is not found in Exodus chapter 1. It is found in Jesus Christ himself. And Jesus Christ is the one who can declare himself to be the divine promise maker and the divine promise keeper who doesn't promise that his people won't have to endure persecution. No, he promises that persecution won't hinder his kingdom program. How is it possible? It is possible because in Jesus Christ we have a God who is both savior and sufferer at the same time. We have a God who both delivers from oppression and one who was oppressed and afflicted himself. He is the one who took on every vulnerability, including subjecting himself to an oppressive regime. The Bible says it was fitting for God to make him the the founder of our salvation, to make him perfect through suffering. You understand, if if you're in Jesus Christ, if If we are in Jesus Christ, what you have, what what we have together is not an invented past of, of stories about people far away that do not touch on the reality of our lives today. What we have is the reality of a saving God from Genesis to Revelation who continues to, to push back and to press back against the darkness of human, of human degradation and oppression and violence and injustice with his power that sustains and enables his people, yes, to even flourish in the midst of it. Two things I want to share just as implications. I'm, I'm finished, and it's not, it's not the, you know, Black Baptist Church finish where I'm going on for another 20 minutes. I'm really finished. <laughs> I'm really finished. Two implications. One is this. We can, we can find ourselves in positions, uh, both positions that are described in this text, the so first implication is, it's personal. Do you, have, do you have a power struggle? See, because all of us, right, are, are in some kind of seat of, of authority. You don't have to be a CEO to be in a seat of authority over, over others, whether you're an executive or a teacher or, or a medical professional or, or a mom or a dad. Whatever it is, the question is, in your seat of authority, who is on the throne? Who is on the throne? Because the lordship of Jesus Christ has, has influence over, over, over you and, and directs the way you exercise authority. Because if Christ is not sitting on the throne as you sit in your seat of authority, you will somewhere and somehow abuse your power and your influence for your own glory. So I'm asking you, us to do the hard work of, uh, of heart examination here. And the second implication is more corporate. It's this. Texts like this, they just remind us, they, as much as they remind us to, uh, to, to, to continue holding on uh, to, the, to the promise of God because the promise of God will not fail, they also remind us to be in constant prayer and particularly constant prayer for the persecuted church. Because we may not be feeling persecution but r- right here where we are, but there are plenty of those who call on the name of Jesus Christ who are under the thumb of oppression right now around the world. And they remind us to be in constant prayer for the persecuted church. Yes, the church will not die. Jesus has promised it, but the Lord delights to hear our prayers and use them as a means to bring comfort and, and peace and even joy who are, to those who are enduring persecution for the sake of his name. And so, so whether, whether we are in, in power or persecuted, We look to and we rest on the grace of God in Jesus Christ alone because as our resurrected king, he sits on the throne with with all power in his hand and he got to that exalted place by embracing the vulnerability and pain of, of, of the oppressed. And he's got both covered. 
And because of that, brothers and sisters, because of that, we don't die. We multiply. Amen. Amen. Would you pray with me? Thank you, Lord, that no power of hell and no scheme of man are able to take us out of your hand or able to destroy your plan, your kingdom expansion plan. Thank you, Lord, for grabbing us out of the domain and power of darkness and bringing us into the light of Christ. I pray, Lord, that you would encourage our hearts with the truth of your promise, the truth of your word, and we will stand on the promises as we live in this world day in and day out to the glory of your name through Christ our King. Amen.